Welcome to Finishing Grace. There is a grace to live and a grace to die, a grace to start and a grace to finish. Finishing Grace will show the patterns and examples of those who will possess the needed attributes to finish the mandate. It will also highlight the expectations of God for the 21st century believer who is now faced with many more challenges than any other generation. Pastor Farooq Muhammad is the lead pastor of Faith Community Church in San Fernando, a strong leader of the word with great prophetic grace. His apostolic mandate from God is to wake up the church in Trinidad and Tobago to its responsibility to the nations of the earth before Christ returns. Welcome, Welcome Pastor. Pastor. Thank you so very much, Frank and Isla, and good afternoon to everybody. Today's topic is how to win over temptations. We're going to look at King David. We'll start with King David. For 40 years, he reigned in splendor and in power. And uh, we can easily say that at the 23rd Psalm could be considered the height of his writing achievements. Yet, sometime just after that writing, Frank, this is strange to believe that he would have wrote a psalm like, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, the Lord being his guide and shepherding him and so on. And yet, uh, sometime just after that, his old nature influenced his life as temptations surrounded him. You know what he did? He slew seven innocent descendants of King Saul. That is one of the temptations that he succumbed to, that he should not have. Now what we are looking at here is about springtime. And Bible scholarship puts this at somewhere around 994 BC. It was the time when King David, he sent the Israeli army to destroy the Ammonites. But he himself did not go. He sent the army of Israel. He stayed back in Jerusalem. He stayed home. Probably he was concerned about how the war was going. And he decided to stay back in Jerusalem and think about it, plan, introspect, and so on. But the thing is that he took his troubles to bed with him. And the reality is that he could not sleep. He could not sleep. See? So he went for a stroll, the Bible says, on the roof of his palace. And uh, in doing that, he looked over the city. And suddenly, his eyes saw a woman of most unusual beauty taking her evening bath. Now, as a God-fearing man, you know what he should have done? Position yourself there. This is a, a man who wrote all these tremendous psalms and so on. And he, he's a God-fearing man. Having seen this extraordinary, unusually beautiful woman, he should have really gone inside and got down on his hands and his knees asking God to give him strength over temptation. Because as a man, I mean, he was a 100% genuine human being and the temptation was there. But he didn't. The Bible says he watched and he watched and he feasted his eyes on the woman. And you see, the thing is, the more you watch, the better the thing looks. Yes, hear what how James puts it in chapter 1. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. There's a scripture where Jesus talked about it's not good for a man to look at a woman with lust. And what this scripture is saying here, that it takes time for the lust to conceive. So you got to look at a woman the first time, and you may see something beautiful, something attractive. Nothing is wrong with that. But I think the problem is when you take the second look. And when you take 
the third look and you keep looking and you keep looking now this is exactly what happened to david he watched and he feasted his eyes on bathsheba she was indeed beautiful but the fact is that she was someone else's wife i am sure that david knew better but although he knew better he still summoned the woman to his house he knew that he was putting his hands in fire you know i mean look at the psalms that he wrote he would have known and the bible tells us that he invites her over to his house and she becomes pregnant with his child to sin once is bad enough but david compounded his sin he first tried to hide the sin by ordering Bathsheba's husband Uriah to return home from the war and he tried to get him to go and sleep with his wife so that the pregnancy would have been ascribed to him but that failed and what happened is that he had Uriah killed by ordering him to the front of the battle line he commits adultery king david and now he commits murder he compounds the sin question how could a man so righteous and so powerful within such a short time allow sin to control and ruin his life and the answer is easy the fact is that he took his eyes off god and directed his eyes towards the sin and the bible records that for this thing david paid bitterly do you know that david's own wives had sexual relations with his own son absalom and that happened on the roof of the palace uh, where everyone could have seen it in view of everyone david's son amnon remember he raped his half sister tamar and absalom killed amnon because of that and absalom was slain in battle so what we see in here is the seed of sin had come back to david's house the seed of sin you know reaped a bitter harvest in david's own family life listen to me my friend temptation always commands a very high price now you know something temptations from on the outside external they have no power on us unless there is a corresponding desire within the inside of us so what you see on the outside got to link up with something in the inside of us so the problem is not what is on the outside but what is on the inside of us when it comes to temptation and when it comes to that temptation becoming a sin how many of us realize that temptation every temptation really is an opportunity to get closer to god it's really an opportunity to get closer to god it's an opportunity to either get closer to the devil or to get closer to god and as sure as daylight you can't avoid this thing called temptation you can't run away from it remember part of the lord's prayer says lead us not into temptation temptation is real and it is sure to ring your doorbell but what i'm saying here this morning is that you need not ask it in for dinner it's going to ring your doorbell it's going to come knocking on your door it's going to come your way you'll be surprised to know that it is closer to your door than you really think sometimes it is right just before your nostrils now when i look at my own self i believe that today's young people face greater temptations today than when i faced temptations as a young man 20 to 30 years ago and so now we are really living in a fast moving world social customs and standards have changed unfortunately so and they've changed for the worse really that i said unfortunately so yet young christian men and women today in this pressure cooker situation they are expected to resist these temptations that are more widely available and they are expected to resist those temptations as effectively as we would have done it in my in my time when i was a young man 
Now, premarital relations are now accepted by society as normal. Premarital sex is considered the norm. What we call shocking up here, no marriage marriages are widely publicized in Hollywood. And it's easy for anyone to see pornographic motion picture, X-rated, double X-rated, R-rated, or whatever have you. It's so common, it's so easy. One doesn't have to travel far to pick up books and magazines at the bookstore. There are no adult bookstores. You go to a bookstore and, and the young people have access to all that is there. On one hand, we have all these things coming at the young people today. And uh, on the other hand, you know, society can never decide exactly what the definition of obscenity is. It's always changing. It's always fluctuating. And because of that, the opportunities for sin, they really come in like a big flood. Because once you can't define what obscenity is, once you can't define nudity, nudity is no longer nudity in the traditional sense of the word. Eh? Now, drugs are easy to come by. And then suddenly we are seeing a phenomenon today. Added to all of this, our young people, they are exposed to what I call the seamy side of government. As leaders whom we respected yesterday, they go to jail for committing all kinds of crimes today. Criminal offenses, sexual offenses, you name it. I'm talking about leaders, especially in our government and so on, who we respected only yesterday. The world, it seems, is falling apart. So the whole philosophy of life is, well, why not enjoy it to the hilt? Enjoy life. Everything is just falling apart. There are no values. There are no standards. You know, nobody's upholding anything. So just enjoy things as they come. See, what we are understanding is this. Sin is fun, big time. Today, sin is fun. It is fun for a moment. It is thrilling. Because you know what? Satan is smart enough to know that people on the whole will not sin if they did not have pleasure in it. So sin is pleasurably sinful. Sin is attractive. Sin is thrilling. Hebrews 11 tells us about Moses. Uh, he knew this. Yet, when he grew up, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. That was a special message from Pastor Farouk's online ministry, it can be sourced on YouTube under Pastor Farouk Muhammad. To all of our listeners, you can contact us at Faith Community Church at the corner of Keat and Mukarapu Streets in San Fernando. You can call us at 653-1587 and 653-7356 or email us at faithcommunitychurch21 at gmail.com. Listen out for Finishing Grace again every Tuesday right here at 2.15 p.m. Have a good afternoon, everyone.